Well, this time of year, during the church calendar, we are working through what the church is to be doing. Uh, It's normal time or kingdom tide. And so we'll be talking about the kingdom of God. Book of Romans today, our particular passage, has some uh, sections on predestination, which I'm going to read and not expound upon. I could go over that sometime, but it's not actually in the sermon today. The section that it does tend to talk a little bit more about Uh, comes from, as you know, we have uh, the Apostles' Creed, um, which we have two creeds. I don't know if you knew that or not. There's a total of two creeds within the church, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Other than that, we have affirmations of faith. And the affirmations of faith from Romans is out of today's reading. You can find it on page 887 in your uh, hymnal if you want to look. So it is there within that Scripture. It is an interesting section of Romans dealing as well with uh, if you've ever been in such a place to where you can't even enunciate your pain, uh, there is a place where God can intercede with prayer and we have that section here. And if God is for us, well then who can be against us? That is from today's section of Romans. The Matthew section, as we press into that, is quite a few readings of parables that Jesus talks about what the kingdom of God is like. Uh, The kingdom of God here on earth. Jesus speaks about it coming, and so he speaks to us. The kingdom of heaven is like, and then it is like, and it is like. In fact, there's quite a few back to back to back to back, and we'll unpack those. I find it fascinating, and where I've got the sermon title today from, is they are very common items. Uh, Mustard seeds, yeast, uh, somebody working in a field, we, uh, somebody fishing. These are all very common everyday occurrences. But the kingdom of God is not what I would call a common occurrence. It is something that we are privileged to live into. So let's go ahead and pick up this morning f- with our reading from Romans. The 8th chapter, verses 26 through 39, if I don't remember right. Yes. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that all things work together for the good for those who love God and who are called according to His purpose. For those whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of the Son, in order that He might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom He predestined, He also called. And those whom He called, He also justified. And those whom He justified, He also glorified. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold His own Son, but gave Him up for all of us, will not with Him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who died. Yes, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, and who indeed intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress, or persecution or famine, or nakedness, or peril or sword? As it is written, for you, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to the slaughter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And from the book of Matthew, the 13th chapter, I pick up in the 31st verse. He put before them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that someone took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of the seeds, but when it is grown, it is greatest of the shrubs and becomes a tree, 
so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in with three measures of flour until it was all leavened. Then we move over to um, the 44th verse. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field when someone found and hid. And then his joy goes and he sells all that he has and buys the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. On finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and caught every kind of fish. And when it was full, they drew it ashore, sat down, and put the good into baskets and threw out the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all of this? And they answered, yes. And He said to them, therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a household who brings out his treasure, what is new and what is old. And when Jesus had finished these parables, He left that place. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, may the meditations of our hearts and our minds be holy and pleasing unto You, and my, my words be Yours. Amen. Well, we have this entire rapid set of parables placed one before another, after another, after another. I would have felt that it would have probably been overwhelming if I would have been sitting at Jesus' feet, just parable after parable after parable, and, and, and then to have to unpack all of that. Well, I, I just want to present to you that I think Jesus, and it says here in the text, if you read around here, that Jesus spoke in parables so everybody didn't know what He was saying. There's a real clear reason that He would do such a thing. Jesus is proposing to bring in the kingdom of God and supplant the kingdoms that are there. That is, He is talking basically rebellion against Rome and rebellion against the leaders. And if you're going to talk rebellion in that day and age, you, you might want to code it a little bit. You might not want to let everybody know what's going on. So Jesus spoke in parables so that those who were of like heart, who understood Scripture, they would understand what He was talking about. You know, in, in life, I've learned that when I was in banking, we had our own code language. We had our own way of speaking among each other so that we all knew what we were talking about. It was more of a shorthand, really, so that as we spoke. And, and I know as each different industry, you have your own way of speaking that may go right by the person standing next to you. Uh, if you're in the cattle business, there are certain ways you speak. If you're in the medical industry, if you're in whatever you're in, financial world, you have your own way of speaking, and it's a shorthand. Uh, but it's also a way that you can speak and maybe nobody else catches what you're saying. Deb and I had gone to a meeting one night, and it was from the school administrator in Kingwood, and he was going over the way some things were going to be changing. And after I walked out, I looked at my wife and I explained what I heard and she looked at me and she goes, I didn't hear any of that. And I said, because he didn't say it for everybody to hear. He said it in a way that if you understood finance, you could read between the lines. And, and Scripture has that. In places you have to be able to not only read the lines, but read between the lines. So we're going to go over that today with today's parables. We're going to kind of push you through those and, and we'll see what Jesus is talking about in these. Now you may already know, so just be patient with me, but we're going to, we're going to go through each of these parables. I, I find them fascinating how they work. The first one would have been very clear to any biblical person of that day. They would have known their Old Testament and when Jesus was talking about the mustard seed turning into a bush and then to a tree, he, he was really going back to the book of um, David and Ezekiel, and in those books, there is an allusion to the idea that when Israel grows up into its fullness, that there would be protection for even the smallest. Even the birds and the bees would have their places 
in the kingdom of Israel. And it uses very clearly these same images of a tree. One is a cedar. A cedar cutting was taken and then planted in Israel. And there would be a place for everything to live in. And, and so there's this image that Jesus immediately starts talking about. The kingdom of God is something that starts very small. And it's going to become something that is large and there is protection for everybody under. Uh, now, I don't have to explain that very long for you to get the idea that what Jesus is starting a very small movement, and he's suggesting that it's going to become very large and there'll be protection for all sorts of people. Now, we live in a world today that we take the kingdom of God for granted. Uh, I don't think we really realize how bad things could be. Uh, we tend to look at things and we go, well, this is normal. Things could be worse or things could be better, but we tend to think of things as this being the norm. And I would suggest that we live more in the kingdom today than, than any other people. Uh, we live in an extraordinary amount of freedom. We live in an extraordinary health care system that has come up through Christian teaching. We have an educational system that came from Christian thought. And these are all from the kingdom being brought into the world. And so we believe in protecting the weak. We believe in protecting the least, the last, and the lost. Well, those are not thoughts that are in most societies. As you see today in the world, there is war, pestilence, difficulty, and hardship. And, and we live in the umbrella of what I would believe is the kingdom of God. And we take it for granted. That's the kingdom that Jesus said is coming. It is small and it will grow into something large. Well, the, the second image is very similar. He, he, he talks about something very common that somebody would have known is yeast. You mix yeast into flour, you give it a little bit of time, and then it triples in size, right? And then you bake it and you get bread. This is a simple, simple metaphor. Uh, what's interesting about yeast, unless you, have, unless you have a microscope, can you see yeast at work on the microbial level? Uh, it, no. Uh, do you see yeast once you mix it into the dough? Uh, no. What do you see? You see what yeast does. You see the increase. You see the increase that takes place. In many ways, the kingdom of heaven works this way. It works in silent and hidden ways, but we see the result of what it does. It starts out small, it's mixed in, it increases, and it feeds, uh, in this image, a great number of people. Now, you may not know, three measures of flour is three gallons of flour. Now, you may not bake bread very often. My wife bakes bread, and I ask her this question, how much bread do you get if you mix up three gallons of wheat? Uh, and she said, a lot. I think two or three cups and we get three loaves or something. Uh, the, the idea is this, is it would have been a commercial baker that would make this much bread. It would have been the baker for the city, the village, would have made this much, about a hundred loaves. So Jesus is not only talking about just what's taking place in your household, but what's taking place in the global village there. He's saying there is food provided in this increase that takes place for many. So we go from small to large, an increase and a protection. So Jesus starts with these two images, then he moves to what I would call a more fun image. Uh, how many of you would like to find buried treasure? D didn't that just sound like fun? It's where the X is on the map. Did you all ever do this when you were kids? You're always out in the yard looking for something. Maybe somebody buried some treasure out in the backyard. Now in Crockett, that's probably a good shot. I've lived here long enough. I have a feeling there are people that lived here that buried some money in the backyard. Don't ask me how I'm thinking that. Y'all are nodding and you're going, back in the day, even more people, back in Jesus' time, they would take money, they would put it in a jar and they would bury it. When we were in Israel, there was always somebody sit on the side of the street selling Roman coins. Uh, you stick a shovel in the ground in Israel, you're hitting something. And, and a lot of times, there's buried coins, they'll find little purse sacks, uh, people buried their money. And so, this would not be a stretch. Now, I just got to ask you this question. If you're in a field and you accidentally dig some treasure up, my bet is, if you don't own that field and you're digging, you're probably a sharecropper. Uh, this is 
the most educated guess I could come up with. You got a plow, you're digging, you hit something, out comes the treasure, right? Now, how excited is a sharecropper going to be to find a pot full of money? You get you getting the idea? Uh, this is an excited. This is a common common thing that might happen. You got to give him something for honesty, though. What does he do? He reburies the treasure. He didn't just take the money because it's not his yet. Buys the field, and then the field becomes his. That's kind of one of those gray areas of you know, right? Did you tell the guy before you bought it the money was there? Yeah, he should have known. It's his field. <laughs> Sorry, it's not in the text. My vivid imagination. It's a fun story though, right? How excited it is for somebody who stumbles upon the kingdom of God. And what do they do? With a wild abandon, they sell everything so that they can possess the kingdom. The story is also the flip side uh, as it's told in the other Gospels that it is us that is the treasure that God buys with everything. Sobering idea that we're the treasures and God buys us. But it's not used that way here. And then we, we, we move on to the next parable. We, we have what? We have a pearl merchant. And what, is, what do merchants do? I mean, you get this idea of what a merchant does. They go somewhere and they buy, in this case, pearls. They bring them back. And what does a merchant do once they own something? They sell it. Good. There was somebody in here who knew that one. Right? The merchant buys something so that they can sell it. Yes, okay, great. So I'm just trying to help you with this whole image. When I was a kid down in Galveston, they used to have, uh, I don't know if you ever did this, they had oysters with pearls already in them. They had like them in a, in a tub of water and you could buy a pearl and you could open it and, and then you found out what kind of pearl you got because they were, they were grown in a farm. Did anybody else do this? That, yeah, Aaron, good job, buddy, yeah. Yeah, a lot more people do that, did that than are raising their hand because when you got the pearl, was yours round? <laughs> the problem with pearls is, is if you've ever seen them, most of them aren't round. Most of them are kind of oblong or kind of misshapen. Uh, they're not always that nice, pretty, pearlescent color. A lot of them are you know, mixtures of colors. Uh, they're not what you'd call, there's a reason they're selling them for a buck a shot. In the water. I should have figured that out as a teenager, right? There's a reason they're cheap. Because a pearl of great price, this is something you've got to go look for. Well, my point of this is the merchant would look long and hard, and why would a merchant want really high quality pearls? Because they're easier to sell. Why would you want something of great value if this is what you did? If you're a merchant and what is it you want to be able to have the reputation of? You want to have the reputation to have product worth having. So Jesus goes from moving this idea of something that is found that is of great value to something that is obtained with great value and the purpose of getting it is so that you move it on to somebody else. These are back-to-back -back right against each other. So we have this idea, it starts small. It spreads out, it affects a lot of things. It has this place where there are weak protected. There is food. It is something of great value and it is something to be passed on. And then we move to this other illustration of a net. Uh, that is, there are fishermen and fishermen were all day long uh, that was the way you would make a living in the Galilee area. Everybody would know fishermen. Everybody would have nets. This particular net, unless you read it in the Greek, you would miss this, is a net that would go from the bottom all the way to the top. It was a net that would gather everything. Now, if you've ever used one of these nets and you've gone saning and you, you get everything off the bottom, do you just end up with fish in your net? Uh, the answer is no. You end up with Coke bottles and Coke cans and license plates. Uh, if it's on the bottom, you get it along with everything. But, but the image is, and all too often the image that will stick with us is, everybody doesn't get into heaven. I hope that's not stunning news for you. All right? Uh, I, and if you have any real sense of equity, there's some people that you kind of wonder, maybe they shouldn't. And I don't want to call out names like Hitler or Paul Pot or, you know, but 
You take your choice there. Uh, there are some people you, you go, well, maybe, maybe not. But that's not the real point of what Jesus is talking about. He's talking more in an estiological way. That is what happens in the end, because what does he say about this net? It reaches from the top of the bottom, and it is drug along until it catches every kind of fish. That is, this kingdom is not just for Jewish people, it is for everyone. And it is a net that drags along and everybody gets caught up in it. And it is not all done until the net is full. Jesus is saying something about the extent, breadth, depth, and length of this kingdom. When I spent a few years working for General Electric Capital and we were in the marketing division, uh, the particular kind of lending we would do when I was talking with the people who were over that area, I said, it seems like we have redundant marketing systems to the same group of people. And he's like, hey, you caught on. He said, look, here's the reason that we do that. He goes, every one of the loans that we want to do, we want to be able to look at it at least three times. That is, we want to know that we've penetrated the market so deeply that if there is one of our deals out there, we want it seen three times and brought to our underwriters at least that many times. That way we know we don't miss anything. I, I think Jesus is saying with this net, this net reaches deep, it reaches far, it reaches wide. We want to be able for the kingdom to see everything. I can tell you in doing prison ministry at East Ham, that every one of those inmates had heard about Christ at least once. Uh, the message of the gospel was not new news. Now, I will tell you this, some of those men needed to hear it more than once. Uh, there's some people in Crockett that may need to hear it more than once. You, you, you see, Jesus says this net needs to be all-encompassing, and it needs to pull along till it's full. And, and, and I see each of these images, and they're very common. And what's beautiful about them is finally Jesus looks, and He talks about all of these, and then He looks at the disciples, and He asks them a point by question. He said, do you understand the parables I've just told you? And God bless the disciples for the first time I think I've ever read in the Gospel. They get it right. They go, yes. I always call them the disciples because they never know what's going on. God bless them, this week they got the answer right. Yeah, we know the answer. Yes, we understand it. Now, Jesus does something very interesting at this point. Oh, you understand what I'm teaching? You've got it going on? You're all there? And this is Matthew's bent. Most of the other disciples don't ever... Matthew goes, yeah, we know where you're going with this. What does Jesus then do? He goes, then your assignment is now you are the scribes. That means if you're a disciple, if you understand what the kingdom is about, if you understand what we're doing here as Christians, then you yourself as ordinary people are now the new teachers and the people who bring forth the kingdom. I hope you're getting the point of where I'm going with this. When I went before the district superintendent and I felt like I was called to be a minister, he said, well, Patrick, every Christian is called into ministry. I want to repeat that one. Every Christian is called into ministry. Some are called to full-time professional ministry. That's what we need to figure out with you. Which of these are you? And so we are all called into Christian ministry. And what Jesus says is, is once you understand the kingdom, once you understand what's going on, then you have this treasure trove like a wealthy man and you go into your house and you bring it out and you bring out wealth from the Old Testament and wealth from the new thing that is going on, and you present this to the world. And that's what we do as Christians. Now, one of the things that's fascinating to me about the disciples is they're all really ordinary guys. They're really ordinary, everyday people. Have you ever noticed that about them? In fact, they're almost like the, the group of nobodies. And Christianity really is a movement of us. Regular everyday people. This, this, week, this weekend on Thursday, I went to a meeting for three days. Uh, I was invited by the district superintendent. Do you ever get one of those invitations and you know it's not really an invitation? You know what I'm talking about. Patrick, we'd like you to be there at two. <laughs> Got it. 
Uh, and what the meeting was for is ministry candidates. We, well, they have now something called a ministry candidacy summit where people who feel like they're called into ministry at younger ages all come and they meet and we sit and we spend the weekend visiting with them and we talk to them about what ministry is like and what the process of going through it is and we encourage them. We do worship together. We pray for one another. Now, what was really fascinating as I met many of these young people is you know what struck me about them? is they were all really ordinary people. They were all just like us. Some were very gifted and very talented, but they were ordinary people called into ordinary ministry. You see, my encouragement out of this, and it comes to this idea from Romans, if, if God is for us, who is against us? We are all called into ministry, and you know, I could suggest that some of you have been called to be Mother Teresa, but the job's already been taken. Uh, I, I could say you've been called to be Desmond Tutu or, or, or any of these great Christians. But, but here's really the idea. We're called to do ministry right where we are. Uh, you're called to do ministry in ordinary, everyday ways. In very ordinary, small ways. Uh, you, you can do ministry in very simple ways of, there are people that need to be listened to. That have been hurt. And they just need somebody to listen to them. There, there are people that just need a meal and you can take food and clothing to share. There are very ordinary ways that we can pray for one another or visit the sick or go see people in the hospital. And, and these are not miraculous, difficult, hard things. They're the very ordinary things that proclaim the kingdom of God in the midst of a broken world. Henry Nouwen said something very interesting about this idea of communion, uh, the, uh, the idea of bread. He said, you know what the people of God really are? The people of God are communion. He said, you are the bread. He said, you are blessed by God, and you are broken, and you are given out into the world. Uh, the, the reason I bring that up is because in the Romans passage it says, uh, are you hurting? Are you broken? Do you have hurts in your life? And I'm going to go, you know what? I bet you do. But for those who have faith in God, God takes that brokenness, that ordinary everyday brokenness that we all share, and He uses that to minister to others. The ministry of the kingdom of God is ordinary and everyday. And it's what we're called to. So if you have brokenness in your life, you have hurts, you have pains, take those to God and then allow God to use those so you may minister to others. We're all called to the ordinary, unexciting, everyday world of ministry. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.